so do you guys remember last week? Kind of. Um, we started back into Philippians chapter, we were at chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. And if you remember, this was, uh, Paul had just ended his introductions, his hellos, his here's how I'm doing, um, all those types of things. And he starts in on his pastoral advice. And he started his pastoral advice with this idea of three metaphors. He talked about citizens of heaven. He talked about uh, soldiers standing together. And he talked about um, athletes contending together to win the prize. And that's how he kind of frames much of what he is going to talk about to the church in Philippi and what he wants to communicate to them. And he starts, so we went over the three metaphors last week, and then this week, we're going to launch into the thing that Paul knows that they need in order to be a citizen, a good soldier, a good athlete. And that idea is unity. Unity. That they need to be together as citizens, soldiers, and athletes. So let's jump into our passage this morning. It's uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Um, and it's in the NLT version, and it says this. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy. Bad English translation, we'll get to that. But he says, make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you learning what unity means and what it takes and how we can do and be a people who are unified together, Father, we pray that you would just open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to your message this morning. That we would come away with a new understanding, a new way of being, a new way of living our lives. Father, that you would reach down into our very souls and give us an image, uh, a fire in our hearts, uh, a word, an action, someone you want us to love on, something, Father, this morning. I just pray so earnestly, Father, that everyone in this room would be able to encounter you, hear from you. So that we can be better followers of you and your son through your Holy Spirit. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, just to preface this, uh, so I'm a kid of the 90s. That was the glory days of cartoons, right? And do you guys remember this cartoon that started in the 1990s? Captain Planet. Captain Planet. Yeah. By our powers combined. They had rings on. Okay, some of you were too sheltered, I guess. Um, and, and what this cartoon was all about was there was these five, they said they were kids, but they certainly look like they're Dawson's Creek in it, right? Because like the redhead on the far left, he definitely looks like he's like 20 years old posing as like a freshman in high school. And um, what would happen is during the episode, some sort of ecological disaster would kind of strike the planet, right? They had bad guys who were like big conglomerate corporations that were trying to trash the world. And so these, uh, no, back one. And so the kids, we'll get to that one. Uh, so the kids would all get together and then they'd put their rings together, right? And then they would say what their ring entitled. So it was like, earth, fire, air, water, heart, which wasn't really an earthy thing, <laughs> but heart, right? And poor Kwame, he was that dude who had the heart and he was always like, really, heart? Anyway. And so when they put their rings together, then Captain Planet was sort of summoned, right? And by their powers combined, Captain Planet would fight the bad guys and save the ecological disasters, right? There was a unity from these five kids' powers to kind of create a solution to a problem. Now, the next slide here is kind of one of my favorites growing up, right? Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Um, now, this was the type of show that when I was a kid, you were not allowed to say you watched it. Like, all the kids made fun of each other. For watching Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, but I'm pretty sure all the kids went home and watched it because it was a pretty cool uh, show, right? 
And so on the uh, left-hand side there, you'll see the Power Rangers. Now you'll see the black, the yellow, the red, the pink, and the blue Ranger. The Green Ranger was not an addition. He was a, a kind of a cliffhanger thing at the end of the first season or second season, right? So he's not part of the original five. His story arc was pretty cool, but, you know, um, that's who they were. And so these were regular teenagers. Again, I put in quotes teenagers because they were like 20-something years old, posing as teenagers. And they knew, like, karate, right? And so um, it was all their exploits as uh, high school teenagers. And then there was like this bad guy who summoned some monster to come and attack their town. Like every single day there was a brand new monster. And like people still lived in this town afterwards, right? And so, and so what they would do is each of them had sort of like a dinosaur that was their power. Red was Tyrannosaurus Rex, and I can't remember any of the other ones. And so I think yellow might have been Pterodactyl, right? Um, and so, so what they would do is, like, sometimes the monster, the, the big bad guy would, like, uh, shoot a lightning bolt, and the monster would grow to epic proportions. Like, think Godzilla, right, in a, in a type of thing. And so teenagers, you know, they're tiny, Godzilla's big. So then what they do is they summon their dinosaurs, right, from their base, and then they would form Megazord. That's the big robot on the right. Um, and you'll notice all their different colors together, not green. I'm just saying he wasn't part of the original five. He had his own separate dinosaur. And so what they would do is they would join together, right? They would become unified in order to fight the bad guy and save the town and then do it again the next day. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And there's like so many like uh, expansions upon that that they've done. It's kind of crazy. Um, by the way, Captain Planet, they're thinking of making a movie. Yeah, I know. And it's like Leonardo DiCaprio is like a producer of it. So I'm wondering if there's going to be like a boat involved, maybe some like singing and some love story where they're drowning in the water. We'll see. Captain Planet saves them. There's enough room on Captain Planet for both people to be saved. So. <laughs> and so these are kind of like childhood examples of unity. What it means to come together in order to accomplish a goal, accomplish a mission, to work together for something that is very important. And this is kind of what Paul is talking about at the beginning of chapter 2. Now this first sentence, right, this first verse, he kind of says like, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Is there any comfort in his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts um, tender and compassionate? That's sort of the English translation of a really disjointed Greek sentence. In the Greek, it's actually, Paul says, um, if encouragement in Christ, if loving comfort, if spirit fellowship, if compassion, affection, right? If, if, if. And these senses, they don't have verbs. They don't have subjects and objects. But it's just saying, if these things. And what we have to do is we kind of have to hear kind of what Paul is kind of saying. And what he's kind of saying is like, if you have encouragement from Christ, whether that's from a friend or um, someone you love or from God himself, if you have been lovingly comforted by God, by a friend, by your community, the church. Um, if you have spiritual fellowship, right? Um, if you are joined together with other people. If you have um, been tenderheartedly loved. If you've been shown affection, right? If people have expressed their deep feelings for you. And Paul here... He's asking for rhetorical ifs, right? Of course these things are true. Paul did them for the Philippians. He loved them. He joined together with them. He started community with them. He encouraged them. He had compassion and affection and taught them how to live for each other. And so when Paul here is writing about these ifs, 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 what he's really doing is he's saying, okay, I just told you, you need to be citizens, you need to be soldiers, you need to be athletes. And the thing here is that you have to be citizens together, right? You have to be soldiers standing firm together. And you have to be athletes working together, right? And to do this, he says, you need to have unity. And what he does is by saying these if statements, he's showing you your motivation, to stay unified, right? We don't stay unified because um, we want to just kind of like, oh, be happy or be in community or have some friends type of thing. But he says, no, the motivation for your unity together as a church 
is that God first chose to be united with you. That's your motivation for wanting to be together. Essentially, he is saying, remember the beautiful things that God did for you. Did God encourage you? Did he comfort you? Did God love you? Did God express his compassion and his affection for you? Remember those things. Keep them in your mind, he says. This is what I want you to be thinking of. Now notice this list, right? Encouragement, comfort, love, fellowship, compassion. Um, that's not, hey, uh, God's going to protect you from all harm, is it? And it's not God's going to give you everything you want in life. God's not going to clear all the paths for you. You see, motivation can't be because, oh, you're trying to get some, your motivation for unity can't be because you're trying to get some reward from God, right? And we shouldn't look to those earthly things that God may or may not do this. What we must do instead is we have to be motivated by God's love towards us first. We should yearn to be unified because God first chose to be unified to us. This is the crux. And, how, and what Paul is pointing to is, here are the rich things that God has given you. Right? The richness of his love, the richness of your fellowship with each other, the richness of the Holy Spirit. Remember that, he says. And then in verse 2, he says this, Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. This is the statement that we get where we need to be unified. It's full of one another's, one another's, one another's. And the first thing that he says that we need for unity is that we need to agree wholeheartedly, right? Um, so that means whatever I think and say, you guys have to agree with, right? Anyone like that? Um, if I say jump, you say how high, because we're agreeing, um, right? And, and so there's this idea, right? Um, this, this English translation, agreeing wholeheartedly, that doesn't quite hit it, okay? Um, the Greek word here is actually uh, phreneo, and, and what it means is he wanted them to be phreneo together. And this phreneo, it's kind of um, in agreeing with each other, it's being on the same page, but it's not an intellectual being on the same page, right? Um, it's not that you intellectually agree with everyone, that you all have the same views of God, that you all have the same ideas of like, oh, this is what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it, and therefore we need to be agree wholeheartedly to be unified. That's not what he's saying. This phreneo is actually much more about your attitude, your will, your choices. Um, it's kind of like, the, the, the jointness together that we're moving in the same direction. And so when Paul says he wants us to agree wholeheartedly, I think what he's really getting at is not so much this like mental ascent that we have to agree with our minds together um, or things like that, but what I think he's getting at is this sort of commitment that we have to each other, right? Um, Kristen's here, 14-ish years ago, almost. 13 and nine months, we got married. Um, and, and what we did was, um, when we got married, of course, we agreed wholeheartedly mentally with each other on every single thing in life, right? Um, and happy wife, happy life, so I agreed with her, you know, maybe. But that's, you know, something for our therapist. And so, <laughs> and so this agreeing wholeheartedly, it's less about like, oh, we're all on the same page, we all think the same thing. But it's, are we joined together in attitude, in will, in... Um, the direction that we are going together. See, when we stood up and we gave our vows, what we were doing was we were committing to each other. We were joining together. We were agreeing wholeheartedly that we would be in relationship with each other for life. Right? And that's kind of what I think Paul is getting at here. He's saying, I want you to agree wholeheartedly with each other, is that I want you guys committed to each other. I want you to have the same attitude that we're in this together. Because you can't be a citizen in heaven. You can't be a soldier fighting your enemies if you don't have that commitment. You can't be an athlete on a team if you don't have that commitment to each other. And so Paul says, agree wholeheartedly. The second thing that he said is required for unity is loving one another. Okay? And, and we might say like, oh, I love everyone in this room, right? 
Um, sort of this like, oh, I got, I, I, like, God tells me to love you. I love you. Um, I might not want to hang out with you, <laughs> right? Or I might not um, like the way you talk or the sound of your voice or, you know, um, anything like that, right? And so, but this loving one another is, again, going back to the character of Jesus. The love here is this word agape. We've talked about this before in Philippians, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and the thing about agape is it's a verb, right? It's not a thought you have. It's not an emotion you have. But agape is this outward-oriented, self-sacrificial love in action towards each other. You see, when Paul says to be unified, you have to love one another, um, you can't just come and show up on the same day and listen to a message and sing some songs, right? That's not unity. Um, unity is actually when we turn to each other, when we start loving each other, when we spend time together, when we serve one another, when we have outward actions that demonstrate our love to each other. This is something that to love one another, you have to have this love for other people demonstrated to them. And you got to accept other people's acts of love towards you. That's really what a, a committed community does for each other. We love each other. We don't just say it, and we don't just feel it, but we look for ways to actually do it for each other. Paul says that is necessary for unity. If the other people in the church just kind of love you with their thoughts or love you with their feelings, like, yeah, great, but that doesn't really help when you're in need, when you're struggling, when you're fighting against your enemies, when you're trying to contend for the gospel, right? Paul says, love one another in actions. And then finally, he says, working together with one mind and purpose. Um, this one's way more difficult to translate because this is actually one Greek word, um, and it's uh, sumsukos, and it's the only time that it's used in the New Testament. Right? So a lot of times whenever we see a word in the New Testament in the Greek, we can go and look at the other times it was used to kind of get this picture of what it actually means. But this is actually the only time, in fact, uh, most scholars think Paul made it up. Right? We get to do that in Christian church. Yay! I'm just going to make up words, and then we get to follow it as if it's the Holy Spirit. Because it is the Holy Spirit, because we agree wholeheartedly, right? Right. But what this idea is like, this working together with one mind, one spirit. So uh, the sum part of it is like this symbios, this joining together. And, and the, the sukas is the word that we get for our um, psyche, um, so our personhood. And so what Paul is getting at here is that we all together need to see ourselves as one soul, one self. One desire, one affection, one caring for each other, one in passion. Now, in America, we love our independence, don't we? Like, I got my feelings, I got my passions, I got my desires, right? And you got yours and yours, and, and we got 40 different people in the room, 50 different people, so we probably have like 75 to 80 different passions, right? Even on just one topic. And what Paul is saying is that for unity... We have to be one mind, one purpose, one psyche. And what I think that looks like here is what Jesus says when he says, and, and in Romans 12, when Paul kind of lists out this community, he says, um, if someone among you is joyful, be joyful with them. If someone among you is suffering, suffer with them. Um, he's saying, if you suffer, I suffer with you. If you laugh, I laugh with you. He's saying, same aim, same goals, a relational commitment. But it's this desire that you and I are so connected as citizens, as soldiers, as athletes, that whatever you are in the middle of, whatever you are feeling, I feel it too. Do you guys have some of those people in your life? Right? The ones you super duper care about? Like, my kids certainly. I see my kids struggle in school or if they get upset or they're being bullied, like, oh, my heart yearns for him, right? And as a church, are we doing that? When someone's in need, do we go, oh man, that's terrible. How can I help? How can I be together with them? How can I be one with them through this thing that they are experiencing? That's what Paul says is necessary for unity. 
you got to work together with one mind and purpose. Um, I kind of liken this unity thing, right? People that um, you kind of are committed to, people that you love one another, you love loving on them, you like it when they love on you, right? And, and this working together with one mind, like when they suffer, I suffer, you, and when they laugh, I laugh. It's kind of this idea of like finding your people, right? Have you guys ever found your people? Um, when Kristen and I were in New York, and we were, um, you know, 16 hours away from our family and friends that we all grew up with, we would often come back to Minnesota for Christmas, like two weeks at a time. And uh, one of these trips, what we both had was an experience where um, we came back, she hung out with her friends, I hung out with my friends, and when I got together with my friends, it was just kind of like a, ah. <sighs> right? You just kind of felt that peace. You felt you could be yourself. You, you, you didn't have to try. Like, these are my people. They understand me. They think similarly. They're aimed for the same things. These are my people, right? Have you guys had those experiences? When I was um, candidating for my uh, current job, right, um, I actually interviewed with several different churches, right? I don't know if you know this, but like, I interviewed with Branchline and other churches before Branchline. And one of my favorite ones was um, when I first got on the Zoom call. So, like, they got my application and, you know, all that type of stuff. And I get on the Zoom call, and what greets me is um, seven dudes over the age of probably 55 wearing suits. <laughs> These are not my people. <laughs> Like, I'm, I'm not saying they weren't loving. I'm not saying they were, like, nothing of that. But, like, as you guys know, I'm a little bit irreverent, right? Like, I like to joke around. I like to shoot the stuff. I like to, you know, sometimes swear, not from the stage, but, you know, if I feel comfortable enough with you, right? Um, I'm not wearing a suit. Sometimes I'll wear a tie for weddings or funerals, right? That was not exactly my people. Like, when I got into that interview, I was like, oh, my guards were up, Right? Oh, these are not my people. Like, this does not feel right. I mean, the interview went fine, but they were like, yeah, you're not a good fit for us. I was like, thank you for saying it so I don't have to, right? But it's kind of like that finding your people. Like, when I first got on a Zoom call with the branch line search committee, right? Like, Ryan Westfall was down in the corner, and he was wearing, like, his metal tee that was cut off at the sleeves. He's got tattoos, right? And then, and then no one was wearing a suit, and there was just like a variety of people, a diversity of opinions, just all walks of life. And I was like, oh, this is my motley crew. Yeah, these are my people, right? Like I could get together with this church. And, you know, I'd read your profile and we, we thought alike. Um, I could see the love you guys had for each other despite your differences. I could see the working together at this church, just sitting in the same room with you, right? Ah, these are my people. Paul wants you to find your people around the gospel, around the Christian faith. He wants us to be unified together. Now, Paul then launches. So he says, you need these things. And then in verse 3, he says this. Uh, so don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. He says, you need to be humble. You need to think of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others. And here's what Paul is saying. Unity needs humility. Like, y'all are not going to be unified if you're out for yourselves. What Paul is saying is, you need to take that sense of self, that self of yours that you've used to protect yourself your entire life, that sense of self that says you get things done on your own, that sense of self that is like, oh, I'm good, I'm capable, I can do this, I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps, right? Paul says, take that self and set him to the side. He says, don't be selfish. He says, you actually have to be humble. You have to have humility. And so he says, no selfishness. That means that, guys, um, we can't hoard ourselves, our money, our time, and our energy just for ourselves. How do you love other people? How do you be in deep community unified with each other if you're keeping everything to yourself? He says it's not possible. 
So we can't hoard our material possessions, our treasures on this earth, our time and energy. We need to give to others. And he says, um, there's this kind of like thoughts of superiority that we kind of got to get away from. Do you remember back in chapter 1 when he was talking about these Christians who, when he was in prison, they started preaching, but they were preaching for the wrong reasons. It was rivalry. It was jealousy. It was thoughts about themselves. Paul is saying, you can't be unified. You can't preach the gospel. You can't be the community you need to be if you're aiming for what, what does this bring for me? And what about me? And what do I get? And he says here that you can't be, um, what does he say? Don't try to impress others, right? So he says, don't be selfish. And then he says, don't try to impress others. Now, the English translation lets us down here on this don't try to impress others thing. Um, because what it actually kind of says is, don't seek empty glory. Empty glory is such a cooler way to say this, right? And what this is, is um, all of those things that you think will fill you up, right, as a person, um, all those things that we strive for that make us feel better about ourselves, to feel like we're full and we're complete, all those things that other people will look at us and they'll be like, oh, that person's so awesome. Paul says all of that is vain. It's empty. It won't fill you up. What he's trying to say when he says, don't try to impress others, is this idea that don't try to fill yourself up by getting stuff back from people. This kind of reflects back to Matthew 6, when, Paul, when Jesus says, when you pray, don't pray on the street corners where everyone's going to see you and think you're so pious. He says, go into a closet and pray. And when Jesus says, when you give, give secretly. Don't do it as a show for everyone to see how much you give. He says, give secretly so that it's not about how those people think about me. Now, prayer and giving are pretty easy ones to understand. Jesus kind of lists it out. But what about this whole idea of like, will these people like me? Right? Um, will these people uh, think that I am knowledgeable? Will they think that I am good? Right? And what Paul says is, you can't be searching for those things because they're selfish. They're empty glory, he says. When you're in community, if you want to be unified for each other, you're not doing anything as part of the community for your own selfish gain. And that means setting aside sort of this need for us to be like, oh, they like me, they see me, they do these things, or I'm doing these things because people will see me. Let me give an example. At our previous church in New York, um, before I got there, there was a transition time where they did not have a pastor. And there was this volunteer guy, um, we'll call him Dave. So what Dave did was, when the pastor left, Dave kind of stepped up into the congregation. And he started, like, mowing the lawn. And he started um, writing sermons. And he started um, sort of doing all of these types of things that when the pastor left, you know, they needed to get done. Which is awesome, right? We would be like, oh, that's so selfless. That's so good. That's so, um, wow, he's sacrificially giving. He's stepping into these roles. Don't you just love that, guys? Right? And you kind of hope that people would do that whenever something happens, that they step into these roles. What ended up happening was, was um, Dave really wanted, to, actually, to be the pastor. Right? Um, Dave actually had this thing inside of him that, he needed others to see him doing these things so that he could feel good about it. And actually, Dave, Dave even went so far as um, when he applied for the job and, and they said no, that um, he left the community. He walked away from those he was supposed to be unified with. See, his, his gifts to the church his um, love for the congregation, what he was doing to serve others, well, it wasn't that self-sacrificial love. He was actually doing it because he needed something in return. He needed to feel better about himself. He needed other people to recognize that in him. That's the kind of stuff that is empty glory. 
God says, serve others so they don't even know you're serving them. Love others without even getting anything in response because that is true glory. That's what we strive for. And then Paul says, the other thing that humility requires is thinking of others more than yourself. Or in this uh, translation, it kind of says, like, don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others, too. Um, and what he's kind of saying is um, sort of this, this idea of if you have the humility where it's not just about you, but you're paying attention to the people around you, if you're paying attention to what they're going through and what they're struggling with, then naturally your choices should align that their needs might mean more than your wants, right? That um, you want to provide something to them that might take away a little bit of your comfort. That you would give in such a way that these other people are sort of more important even than yourself. And what Paul says here is that he says, um, think of others, but what he actually uses is this um, look out. And the idea is, who do you have eyes on? Whose needs and whose um, sufferings are you actually looking at on a daily basis? See, I think it's natural as humans that we focus mostly on our own, right? Like, oh man, I got to do this. I got to get this. I got to, this is my needs, my wants, mine, 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 mine. And what Paul is saying is, if you are going to be a unified community, you have to set yourself to the side. Not in a way where you don't take care of your needs. That's kind of silly, right? But in a way that you're actually mindful, looking out for, intentionally seeking where are the people around me, especially in our community, that I can love on. And so I've said before, like, part of this is preparing your life to be able to see those people. So we've talked before about simple living, right? That idea that you would, with your finances, with your time and your energy, you would spend less, um, you wouldn't be as busy, that you would have space and a margin in your life to be able to view other people. That you could actually see them and see what their needs are and then actually have the opportunity to help them. And church, this also means that um, when other people see that they have eyes to help you, you actually have to accept it. Yeah, that American, like, exceptionalism thing where it's like, oh, I'll help you. I'm okay with that. You helping me? Eh, that doesn't feel good, does it? And I'm not saying you got to go out to, like, the entire church and send out a prayer request to be like, hey, guys, I misplanned and I just don't know what I want to make for dinner. Could someone deliver a meal? That's not kind of what we're talking about here. But, but what we are talking about is, like, when you're actually in need, are you, are you sharing that with your small group of Fellow believers, are you sharing that with your community? Um, are you willing to set yourself to the side in order to accept the help that you need? And are you helping others? And, and Paul says he wants his community to do all of this. And, and in our English translation, it says, make me truly happy, right? Be unified to make me truly happy. But what he's actually saying is, make my joy complete. Make my joy complete. I'm going to go a little long here. We're not going to do a final worship song, but uh, I'm loving this. So he says, make my joy complete. And what this means is, um, do you remember back in chapter one when he says, there is a joy in the gospel, a good work that the father has started within you. And he says, God's going to fulfill that to completion. I know it beyond a shadow of a doubt, but he's talking about this joy that he felt when the Philippians responded to him, when they joined him in community, when they first accepted the gospel. There is a joy in that, he says. But now he says, make that joy complete by being the mature disciples, the ones who love each other, who are able to set aside themselves in favor of others in their community. He says, that level of unity is what I want from you. That will bring me joy in my heart as a pastor. Guys, this is like the heart of a pastor. Is not that, like, my joy isn't so much like standing up here talking, and my joy isn't so much like running a church. My joy is when y'all get it. Okay? That's what Paul's getting at here. When, when pastors see people around them become not just consumers of whatever the church has to offer, but they are now 
givers. They've taken away the self, and now they are out there loving other people, self-sacrificially, just as Jesus did. This joy, people, that's a pastor's heart for joy. Um, in Hebrews chapter 5, um, Paul, he kind of um, is angry at the Hebrew people, so I won't read it because it doesn't quite fit the, the, the tone here this morning. But he basically says something to the effect of, um, I came and I taught you guys these things, and yet I still have to come back and reteach you and reteach you and reteach you. And what he likens it to is um, that they crave milk, like an infant, a baby craves milk. And he says, shouldn't you guys be so mature now that I shouldn't have to feed you? But in fact, you should be feeding others. That you should be craving the, you should be able to feed yourself. You should be able to feed others. That you are so mature, you're so advanced, that you are unified, that I don't have to take care of you anymore. Is kind of what he gets at. And I think it's this heart that Paul is trying to get at with these Philippians. He says, make my joy complete by becoming mature me anymore. That's what Paul is going for. Make my joy complete so that you are so mature, so giving, so selfless that I don't have anything left to teach you. And I know this is not like a linear path, but there's kind of this idea that at one point we're Christ we become Christians and we need stuff. We get stuff. It's all about us and our growth and all that type of stuff. And that's totally normal and okay. But there should come a point where we are so transformed that we don't need others to feed us. Don't get me wrong, you still get loved on by each other. You still get all the things you need. Um, you still like are part of a community where they love on you, you love on them, right? But it's no longer this point where like someone has to tell you to do that. Someone has to walk by and hold your hand so that you love other people. They don't have to keep reminding you. And church, my desire, my heart, I would find the most joy when I see you guys transformed into mature believers who put aside yourself and love others. And my joy would be made complete as we together, as a community, as citizens of heaven, as athletes, as soldiers together, we labor on to tell other people about that gospel. That we get that initial joy thing where they accept Jesus where they start following Jesus. And yeah, they're going to take some milk and we'll, we'll, we'll bring along the easy milk stuff, right? But we can do that because we have matured. We are now the givers. That is my desire. That is what I want us to see here at Branch Line. That is my hope that we do together. And remember that we are citizens, soldiers, athletes, striving together, not just for Branch Line, not just to have a place where we're accepted, we love each other, hey, it's a nice country club where we all get along, right? We're not doing unity for unity's sake, right? People can be unified around a lot of stuff. Gangs are very unified. But what are they unified around? Well, it's territory, it's drugs, it's guns, it's whatever. We need to be unified around the gospel, our mission together, that thing that we are striving for as citizens of heaven, as soldiers, as athletes. And church, we need to be unified as we do that. Because the enemy is going to attack us. Um, we're all going to suffer in other ways. And gosh, guys, it would be so nice if we weren't doing it all alone, right? If you didn't have to pull yourself up by your bootstrap, but you had like 50 other people who were like, wow, you're in need, how can I help you? That's a beautiful community to be a part of, right? Citizens, soldiers, athletes, this is why we are unified together. So set aside yourself. Be selfless. Don't pursue empty glory. Do things out of the goodness of your heart like Jesus did for us. Think of others more than yourself. Agree together. Be committed together. Love one another so that we can work together with one mind, one purpose, one mission, spread the gospel, and make God's kingdom grow. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the selfless gift that your son gave. As he left communion with you, as he came to this earth and endured 
persecution, slander, threats to himself, and ultimately, Father, his unjust death. We pray that we would embody that same selflessness. Father, that you would help us to set aside all those things that we're searching for, we're trying to gain from this faith. Father, give us a picture of your son and all he did so that we can be like him, so that we can love others in action, so that we can find the true glory that is service and giving of oneself to the people around us. Father, we pray that you would bring us together as a community to keep us unified around that idea that there is something bigger than ourselves. Father, that we're here for each other, that we support one another. Help us to open our eyes to those in community. Help us to put their needs ahead of our own desires. Help us, Father, to be the body of Christ here in Hastings, in our homes to our families, at work to our coworkers, Father, may we be the people that seek you, seek to live as your son lived. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.